think you've aged me by 10 years, so oh, I? only 25 years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Can't be <laughs> Yeah. Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for organizing this meeting. It's a real pleasure to be here, and a, a real honor to share the platform with the other speakers. So I'm just going to talk about a few things quickly, because we've only got 10 minutes. I just wanted to go over pre-October 7 healthcare and the impact on the Palestinian people post October 7, um, and particularly seeing it through the lens or the eyes of the medical profession, the responsibility of the Israeli medical profession, what's going on in Palestine, in Gaza and occupied territories. Um, and then just a, a, a quick word about the BDS campaign as it applies to the health sector. I think uh, there's a lot of promise to extend the BDS campaign much more widely into the scientific, medical, and professional sector that I'll come up with. Okay, so before October 7, and these figures are all before October 7, the, the, the Nakba, the military uh, occupation, the ethnic cleansing, and the whole Zionist project obviously had huge implications for the health of the Palestinian people just as it did in apartheid South Africa. You might hear I'm South African for my accent. And in fact, I worked with the Anti-Apartheid Health Committee maybe 40 years ago now. Um, and uh, we campaigned against the Medical Association of South Africa and tried to kick them out of international organizations because of their collaboration with the apartheid regime. So, um, just some, some statistics for you. Life expectancy figures, um, Palestinians in the OPT, 73.5, Israel, 82.5. That's, uh, that's almost nine years longer for Israelis. Infant mortality rate is 6.2 times greater for Palestinian children. That's kids under one. How many of them die per 1,000 births? Maternal mortality rate per 100,000. Palestinian women, 20. For Israeli women, Three, the number of doctors per thousand residents in the West Bank is 1.5, in Gaza it's 2.8, and this is respectively 2.3 times and 1.25 times less than for uh, Israeli communities. The number of hospital beds, 2.3 times higher for Israelis. The number of nurses and midwives, 2.3 <coughs> times higher for Israelis. And get this, the per capita health expenditure, in other words, the amount of money spent on each Palestinian as opposed to each Israeli citizen, is 10 times higher for Israelis. The, the, the implications of the whole racist Zionist project for the way health services are rolled out is obviously profound. And there's a particularly illuminating statistic. You mentioned the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Israel excluded 5 million Palestinians from getting the COVID vaccine. But they did make sure to vaccinate the 660,000 settlers in the West Bank and the 22,000 Palestinian workers who worked in the settlements, but nothing for the, Israeli, uh, for the, the Palestinian villages and communities. And what did the Israeli health minister, minister say, say at the time? It's not Israel's job to provide them with vaccines. And of course it is. As you all probably know, under international law, the occupying power has the responsibility to the fullest extent possible to provide services for the, for the occupied uh, uh, population. You know, you heard about polio. Polio has been found in Palestine because of the destruction of the water system, the sewage system, and so on. Um, the Israeli military are receiving polio vaccine. And the WHO are trying to bring vaccine into the communities. But as somebody said, in fact, on Electronic Intifada the other night um, from Deir al um, what's the point of vaccinating kids when two days later the house is bombed and blown up and the children die anyway? Um, okay, so that's pre-October 7. Now, you'll all know that... A specific war aim, although not stated, of the Israeli military is to target the health sector. And I think it might have been John Elmer, who also appears on Electronic Intifada, who said that they seem to start with the hospitals when they go into a new area. 
they go for the, the first thing they do is they tell the, the, the doctors and patients to get out, to evacuate. Then they target the hospital. Eventually, they invade with ground forces. They, they kill people. They murder people. They drive people out. They detain doctors, murder doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers, take over the hospital, and often destroy it. And then the, 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 the military attack widens out. Um, so some of the, the atrocities, and they are endless, and we, we could be here all night talking about this, that have happened in and around hospitals. In Nasser Hospital, they shelled the maternity hospital from a tank, right? Drones are killing patients and health workers in Kamal Adwan Hospital in, in Gaza City. And there's that notorious uh, uh, incident where they, you know, these great big military bulldozers, those D9 bulldozers, that awful weapon of war. They drove over patients sleeping in tents in the hospital courtyard in Kamal Adwan Hospital. Babies have died in ICUs because no power. They cut off all the power in both Al Shifa Hospital and Al Nasser Hospital. And talking of Al Shifa, I'm sure you all remember the awful, awful events, the fourth invasion in March, April, where they drove out everybody, murdered countless people. I heard a figure of 1,500. And one, one Palestinian journal, journalist referred to as the Al Shifa events as probably the biggest massacre in Palestinian history. And you will have heard of the mass graves that were found at Al Shifa after the, the military left, and also in, in Al Nasser Hospital in, in Khan Yunus. Jenin's Ibn, Ibn Sina Hospital, where they, the special forces of the Israelis have got dressed up as women and doctors and nurses. They went into the wards and they executed three young Palestinians, one of whom was a, a resistance fighter literally putting a pillow over his head and shooting him through the pillow, like you see in the movie. So this goes on and on and on and on. Um, but then moving on to the wider implications of the, of the genocide and the impact on families and communities and so on. Again, I don't need to spell this out in great detail because I'm sure you can all imagine it if you don't know the actual figures. But there have been some heart-rending and almost impossible to watch interviews with some of the doctors that have come back from, from Gaza, the particularly one that struck me, Dr. Mark Perlmutter, a, a, a US surgeon, who spoke about, he said that the amount of carnage against civilians was greater he'd seen in 40 missions to war and disaster areas over the last 30 years of his career. He talked about children being incinerated and shredded those were his words. It was unbearable to listen to and, and to watch. Toddlers being shot in the head, in the middle of the chest, targeted by, by these, these monsters in the idea. So, I mean, as I say, I could go on and on, but I don't want to spend too much time going over all the atrocities and all of that, because that's a downward spiral. I just wanted to... To spend a couple of minutes talking about the, the collaboration and complicity of the Israeli medical profession. Throughout, from 1948 onwards, there have been complicity in the whole Zionist project. And we see it in spades when it comes to the genocide. They have been absolutely silent over the whole siege and blockade in Gaza. All of the atrocities in the medical, in the health sector, nothing, said nothing. You remember the doctors who signed that letter, bombed the hospitals just before Al Shifa? In, in November last year, 82 Israeli doctors talked about Palestinian people as wasps and snakes, and they should be exterminated. It's the right and duty of the IDF to bomb the hospital. Doctors coming out from detention and talking about being tortured and, and neglect of patients in, 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 in uh, Israeli jails. The complicity of doctors in the jails taking part in the torture, beating patients, refusing their medical treatment, severe injury and deaths have, have, have arisen because of it. Now, I'll, I'll just finish. Um, sorry, just two more quick points. You'll have heard about Sede Teman, the notorious torture center, one of many spread across Israel. Um, there's a report by Beth Salem, which is called Welcome to Hell which sets out in great detail what's going on in Israeli jails in terms of torturing 
uh, prison. It's routine. Just put the phones off, everyone. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah. Um, so torture is routine for every prisoner on a daily or se every second day basis. I'm, I'm sorry, I should have given a trigger warning to everybody. What I'm talking about is obviously traumatizing. The gang rape of the prisoners by the Israeli uh, uh, military in these prisons. Also, regular, routine, everybody gets it. Now, what, what happened in that case? That particular prisoner was taken out of Sedet Teman, was taken to hospital because he was discovered in the clinic, which is next door, the pens where they keep all the prisoners, where the doctors working there can hear the screams and the terror of the prisoners, right? Do they report it? Hell no, they don't. They did transfer, transfer this prisoner. He was operated on. They, 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 the extent of the injuries, they ruptured his rectum, right, with one of these instruments, whatever they used. So they, they patched him up. He had to have a colostomy. I don't know if you know, but what happens when you repair the bowel in surgery, you have to have a, a hole cut in your abdominal wall and you have a, an opening so that your waste products can come into a bag because you can't uh, go to the loo through the back passage anymore because that's the traumatized area. What did they do afterwards? The doctors sent him back to Sede Teman. That is totally, totally against the medical code. You cannot do that. It's, it's written up in all sorts of conventions. Then the legal defense team asked the doctor, a senior surgeon in Hadassah Hospital in, 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 in Jerusalem, for an opinion, who caused the injuries? Guess what he said? The inmate himself. I mean, I won't, I won't go into the gory detail of the medical report, but that was his conclusion. So lastly, just to finish, I'm so sorry, Chair. I'm, I am abusing you a little bit, forgive me. Um, the, the boycott campaign in the health sector and in the wider scientific and professional sector, I think is very important. We've just launched a campaign as Health Workers for Palestine to throw Israel out of the International Association of Family Doctors. We're collecting signatures. There's a conference in Dublin in, in the end of the month. There's another conference next year in Lisbon of the World Organization. And we are going to drive Israel out of all of these organizations. Who wants to sit in the same room as people who, sit, who, who support genocide? Mm -hmm. Who wants to sit in the same room as doctors who, who don't speak out of all about all of these atrocities and these crimes against humanity? And I think there's great potential for this. There are hundreds, literally, of health organizations and scientific organizations where we could get Israel out. So I would urge you all to think about other ways and other areas that we can campaign on the, in the, on the BDS front. It's not only Barclays Bank and the weapons, although they are incredibly important, of course. It's also the scientific and medical and professional sector. Thanks very much.